We need to promote a culture of life uh, throughout each and every state. We need to advocate as state legislators. We need to uh, have these pregnancy care centers in every community where there's an abortion facility, and we need to protect women and their children. Can you help break this down for us? What are the legal implications of Roe v. Wade being overturned? Uh, and, and what happens now that it's been struck down? Absolutely. Well, something uh, I think that most people didn't realize was just how extreme Roe was. Um, so Roe and Casey talked about balancing the right to life against the so-called right to an abortion. But Kurt, they did no such thing. What they did was they took away from the states the power to protect life until viability, which is about 21 or 22 weeks. And they allowed states like New York or California or Vermont or Virginia to permit abortions up until the minute before birth. So there was no balancing that took place in a row. It was just this imposition uh, of an extreme abortion policy on all 50 states. Now we see with the Supreme Court's opinion overruling that abhorrent decision uh, that the states can once again protect life. Uh, at this point, that does not mean that abortion is illegal. Uh, it simply gives power uh, to the elected branches, to the Democratic branches, to protect life. Can you give us an idea of uh, the scope and the gravity, the importance of Roe versus Wade being overturned? I, I don't think you can think of a, a case in recent times uh, that has been more significant um, and that who's overruling uh, is more significant. Uh, as you well know, we have lost 60 million children, about one every 30 seconds, uh, to abortion since Roe was decided in 1973. We have lived under Roe's regime of mandated on-demand abortion for nearly half a century. And so it is a huge reason uh, to rejoice uh, that the Supreme Court has overruled that case. Uh, as the decision says, the Constitution nowhere protects a right to an abortion. Uh, it says nothing in the constitutional text, structure, or history. Uh, rather, uh, it allows states and the Democratic branches to protect life, which is huge. <laughs> we believe that, that every child is created in the image of God. God, um, and states can now protect those lives. Mm. Boy, I, I, I agree, and, and so many millions of us are, are rejoicing right along with you. You know, I, I have six children together with my wife, and my wife is an adopted child. She was this close mm -hmm. to being aborted, and we have four adopted children who are also one doctor appointment away from not being here. And if my wife were not born, either would our two natural-born children. And so uh, this idea of, of championing and celebrating and defending life uh, is so important to me personally. Uh, but, but back to Roe v. Wade, why did the Supreme Court overturn Roe v. Wade? I mean, was there a, a vote among the new justices that now said, hey, we, we believe that abortion is wrong? Or was it, no, 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 that's not their job. What they did was decide that the decision of Roe v. Wade was actually an unconstitutional decision. What, why, why did they overturn it? Uh, it was the latter, Kurt. So what the justices did, um, and as you say, it's a new court. Um, this is actually the first time in 30 years that the Supreme Court uh, was faced with the decision whether or not to overrule Roe. Um, and it was the perfect time uh, to bring that case to the Supreme Court uh, because we have justices now who are committed to originalism. They're committed to the constitutional text. They're committed to not making up rights uh, like the so-called right to abortion. So what the Supreme Court decision does is it walks through the reasoning in Roe, uh, which even the late Justice Ginsburg thought was, was overbroad um, and unjustified. So it's hard to find a legal scholar who would actually defend Roe. Uh, instead, what they said was, well, we just need to keep it because it's already there, uh, this, this doctrine known as stare decisis. But of course, that, that doesn't make much sense. Uh, uh, if a doctrine is wrong, um, it needs to be corrected, uh, particularly where it costs 60 million lives. So the Supreme Court looked at the Roe decision. They said there's no basis in the Constitution. And uh, so they overruled Roe uh, and follow on cases like Casey. And, and like you said, this is... This is a, a decision that's been on the books for 50 years in America. What, what triggered the overturning of, of Roe v. Wade? What, what, what made this happen now? 
You know, that's a really great question. And it's because of voters in Mississippi. So in 2018, the Mississippi legislature voted to protect life. And the thing is, Kurt, this was a really modest uh, restriction. It was modest pro-life legislation. And what Mississippi said uh, is we believe life is valuable and we are not going to allow abortions after 15 weeks. Again, this accords with what the majorities of the country in the uh, countries in the world do. Uh, so modest restriction, um, it's uh, consistent with international consensus. And importantly, at 15 weeks, a baby has a heartbeat. She can move uh, and she can stretch. Uh, she can hiccup as uh, she is fully taken on the human form. And even though this law didn't apply to 15 weeks, both lower courts struck it down under row, saying, sorry, Mississippi, you're out of luck. Your voters cannot protect life because Roe forbids states from protecting life until viability. Again, around 21 or 22 weeks gestational age. It's, it's so good to hear you frame this the way that you're framing it um, about protecting life uh, rather than protecting a woman's uh, choice mm -hmm. to abort her baby. And so much of this is about perspective. Is and we've got to have the right perspective. Since the court is not the branch of our government that makes laws, and yet the Supreme Court effectively made Roe versus Wade the law of the land for 50 years, how did they get the power to do that? That is a great question, Kurt. And in Justice Alito's opinion for the court, um, he says we don't we don't have that power. <laughs> uh, as, as his draft opinion explained, a Roe was just an exercise of raw judicial power. Uh, where the court's job is simply to interpret the law. Um, and again, if you look at that Roe decision, it reads exactly like legislation. Uh, seven justices, uh, seven men uh, even, uh, on the Roe court implemented a trimester system, which uh, looked like legislation. It doesn't look like a judicial decision. Um, and so you're absolutely correct. The Supreme Court has no warrant uh, to uh, make uh, uprights uh, that are extra constitutional and certainly no warrant uh, to act like legislators. But this shows us how important that Supreme Court power is because effectively they can make things law by saying, well, this is an, uh, an interpretation of the Constitution, therefore it's sort of part of the Constitution, and somehow abortion snuck in there, and uh, now it's legal to um, end the lives of babies in the womb. Some commentators have said now that the Supreme Court has overturned Roe, they've lost their legitimacy. But they were also saying that if, if Roe uh, was not overturned and the court succumbed to all of the pressure and the bullying and the protests outside of the justices' homes, that that would make them lose their legitimacy. So uh, is, is this true? Do you think the Supreme Court has now lost its legitimacy in the eyes of the public? Absolutely not. I think the Supreme Court has regained some of the legitimacy it lost in 1973. Um, and as you mentioned in your previous question, uh, the Supreme Court can be a dangerous branch of government if you have justices who believe in this sort of living constitutional idea uh, that they can simply make it up. And using, you know, even even the best intentioned justice uh, is, is not someone uh, who should be making law for our country. And so what the Supreme Court does and what the majority opinion does is say, is that if you are going to find a liberty interest in the United States Constitution, then that liberty interest has to be deeply rooted in our nation's traditions and history. And that is a way of keeping the justices more to the text to make sure they don't impose simply their own independent um, policy preferences. Um, and that's why Roe is absolutely an unconstitutional decision because there is zero history and tradition of a right to abortion in this country. Erin, the news that the draft opinion that was leaked prior to <clears throat> the official announcement, it was such a big deal. It's water under the bridge now, but at the time, it was, it was everywhere. And, and, and the justices talked about what an egregious act this was. What is so dangerous or so concerning about an opinion like that being leaked early? Well, I, I think one thing, Kurt, is it's entirely unprecedented. 
Uh, there were a couple of the news articles that tried to suggest, you know, this has happened before, um, but that's absolutely not true. A draft opinion has never been publicly leaked uh, before that opinion came down. And especially in a case like Roe, where one can only presume uh, that the leaked opinion was uh, leaked in order to pressure and harass justices, as you mentioned, protests at the justices' homes uh, with young children. Um, and this is just not the way uh, democracy is supposed to work, at, at least in respect to the judicial branch. Um, so there should never be protests um, at someone's home. Um, and the leaked opinion damaged the court as an institution. And I'm thankful to say that they maintain their courageous decision uh, to overrule Roe. Tell us, now that Roe v. Wade's been overturned, do we all just go home? Is, uh, is, is, is the job done or is there lots left to do? Absolutely not. I think actually the work is just beginning. Um, so until uh, Roe versus Wade was overruled, uh, states, uh, communities, churches were really handcuffed from protecting life, um, from helping women uh, to encourage uh, families to flourish. Um, and now states are allowed and empowered to protect those lives, both mothers and children. Um, and we really must come alongside uh, those women um, and, and support life. There's a, a concerted effort, I'm finding, for, for people to really establish personhood for babies in the womb. And uh, science has helped so much with this, with the ultrasounds, uh, the 3D and 4D I imaging. Uh, what's next in recognizing rights for babies in the womb? You know, that's a great question, and there's certainly a good argument to be made. You know, the United States Constitution, uh, as interpreted by the Supreme Court, currently protects corporations uh, as persons. Uh, so, so one would think uh, the babies, uh, unborn babies, could also be protected uh, as persons uh, under the 14th Amendment of the United States Constitution. And I think a lot of work uh, needs to be done uh, by legal scholars, uh, by advocates before the court, to just encourage this idea that we have the history under the 14th Amendment uh, to protect unborn babies. And now that the Supreme Court has returned uh, the, the authority and the rights to the states to decide what's going to happen with regard to abortion, uh, what will these laws look like? I mean, does each state sort of uh, have a, a template or is there a, a prototype that they're going to go by or can they start from scratch? I think you'll see a lot of different approaches. Um, and if you look at the legal landscape before Roe, there were a handful of states, I think 12 states that had trigger laws that said if and when Roe was overruled, then we as a state want to protect life. Uh, there were another handful of states that had pre-Roe laws uh, that were on the books um, but weren't being enforced uh, because of Roe. And then there were some states that had laws that had been enjoined by federal courts because of Roe versus Wade. So now we've got all these different sort of laws uh, that states can use uh, to protect children. Uh, some of those are even being challenged in court um, as we speak. But the legal community and states, the legal pro-life community, I should say, and states uh, will do everything they can uh, to support uh, and defend these pro-life laws. Erin, uh, tell us a little bit about some of the ways that Alliance Defending Freedom is, is celebrating and protecting life. Absolutely. Well, well, first of all, it's just a huge generational win to actually say the words Roe versus Wade has been overruled. Um, that is something that so many of your viewers, that so many at Alliance Defending Freedom have been working for for decades. And that means that states have the power to protect life. And as we discussed in the last segment, Roe is an extreme outlier among international law. It required states to permit on-demand elective abortions for any reason up until viability, which is 21 or 22 weeks of age. It wouldn't even allow a really modest law like Mississippi's, which protects life starting only at 15 weeks. So it is a huge win uh, that Roe versus Wade is gone. Um, but, but as we mentioned, the work is really beginning. Um, Alliance Defending Freedom and others will be defending these pro-life state laws. We will be encouraging churches and communities to come alongside women and promote flourishing um, from conception uh, through birth uh, and beyond. Sometimes I, I sit and think of possible scenarios in the future. Uh, just like the Supreme Court was able to make abortion legal in all of the states, is it possible that the Supreme Court could make abortion illegal in all of the states? 
So there's an argument to be made under the 14th Amendment, like we're talking about, that the unborn are persons under the 14th Amendment. I think initially what we're going to need to focus on uh, is these individual states, because right now under the current decision, states have the power to protect life. But as we're seeing and as we saw in anticipation of Roe's demise, a lot of liberal states are still permitting abortion up until the moment of birth. And that is just uh, sort of uh, outlandish, uh, given what we know about babies and their development much earlier. Um, So we need to promote a culture of life uh, throughout each and every state. We need to advocate at state legislators. We need to uh, have these pregnancy care centers in every community where there's an abortion facility. And we need to protect women and their children. Does the overturning of Roe versus Wade uh, have any significant effect in states like California, where we have uh, a a bill, and I can't remember the name of it, you probably know it, uh, that involved um, protecting physicians against abortion for uh, perinatal birth problems, Mm -hmm. which has been described as being able to abort children feasibly after they're born, which would amount to infanticide. Is that an overstatement or or what do you think? Uh, absolutely not. So in a couple of bills around the country, uh, including California, there was this language about perinatal uh, death. And, and what it did was it immunized uh, doctors as well as parents and forbid any investigation into, quote, perinatal death. And the perinatal period extends at least seven days beyond birth. So this bill uh, on its face exempted um, negligent uh, infant death um, until at seven days after birth. So so completely outrageous uh, sort of law, definitely infanticide. Um, and, and the Roe decision doesn't have anything directly to say about that, but it certainly says that the people of California can come in and say, no, uh, we don't support infanticide. We want to protect life. I'm not a lawyer, but what's wrong with thinking that if abortion is killing a baby, and I believe that it is, and murder is illegal in all of of our states, why then would we allow any state to legalize abortion? I think that's a great question, Kurt. And if you look at the scientific evidence, this was one of the interesting things about the Roe debate. Um, In 1973, if you look at an ultrasound, you really can't see much. Um, So you can almost, almost, no, you can't, but you can almost see, understand sort of what the justices were thinking when they called it potential life when they call the baby potential life. Today, that argument no longer exists. If you look at a 40 ultrasound, uh, science suggests, or actually proves, I should say science establishes, that life begins at conception. And so you're absolutely correct uh, that every state, I I think, should protect life. Uh, We know it's life, um, and we know um, that it's worthy of protection. So as we look to the near future, what's the next big item coming down the line. What is the legal focus going to be now that Roe has been overturned? So I would encourage all of your voters in every state to focus on their states and on their communities. That is the next battleground. We are going to see legal challenges to pro-life laws. We are going to see state Supreme Courts being asked to enshrine abortion in state law, in state constitutions. And this is something that must absolutely be stopped. Every life uh, is deserving of protection. Uh, Human life uh, is a right. Um, So we need to uh, convince Uh, voters as well as the courts uh, to protect life. That's right. Uh, This battle is not over. It's just beginning. But the the tide is shifting and uh, things are moving in the right direction. And now's the chance to lean in with everything that we've got and protect life. 